resume recording. Um, there, oh, where did you go? Oh, there you go? I know you did send me some resources like the, the YouTube video. Um, and then obviously there's 240, although I did do 240 and it's like, it wasn't the most helpful to me. I also bought the rebook from Barnes and Noble. So that's something else that I'm using as well as a resource. But I think I, uh, cause I passed science and math the first try, but those are my two better subjects for sure. Reading, I've never taught before. I've taught math five years. So social studies has a, been a struggle cause I know it's a lot of memory and it's just a lot of information overall. Right, it's a lot, it is a lot of information. So, um, the important thing as far as preparing for this particular exam, uh, the social studies portion of it, like you said, it's different. It's not so much a skill. Like for me, math, I, I, to be honest with you, if I were to take this exam, social studies would probably give me the most challenge of all the subjects um, for many reasons. Um, I mean, I would have to go and review a lot of these things because you have to be familiar with the ideas, concepts, and people, the names, right, that mm -hmm. students are going to be responsible for. And so we'll take a closer look about what that means. Here's the manual here, and you should have received this where, um, and, I, and it, you know, it, whatever, I'm so glad that you, that the harder ones for us, other people, I mean, for most people, it's the other way around, right? It's like science and social, uh, not science and math, you know, ELAR, those ones really give people a difficult time. <clears throat> not That's not to say social studies is easier, mm -hmm. but um, it needs its own, you know, sort of specialized uh, study. It's four, four through eight. Oh, sorry. This always happens. You're fine. <laughs> Thanks so much. All right. Let's see. I was going to do EC through six, but I taught fifth graders for the last five years, and I don't think I could go down. <laughs> right. No, I agree. I mean, not agree. I kind of I kind of want to do that. But, you know, I'm going to be 41 this year. And, and I've had like a lot of health problems because I had five children and I breastfed them for 11 years. And I've been teaching teachers for like maybe. Um, since 2016 uh mm -hmm. what are we now that's for six years six years teaching teachers and uh, before that since 2003 I, I taught in schools but always at the junior high and high school levels because when I, before I graduated my Thea was an elementary teacher she's retired now at um you know an elementary in Brownsville and she, and I I I got out of school early for college. She had to have surgery. I subbed, permanent subbed for like a week and it was second grade. And I was like, like a, you know, energetic kid still then. And I was exhausted physically, everything was like. <laughs> and so when I finally graduated, I thought that's too much to do every day like I want to have discussions and get into the nitty-gritty you know and so I wanted that older student so I did um I did ELAR four through eight but I didn't do even sixth grade like and that was in my many you know decades long of teaching I, I never did sixth grade because sixth grade always still felt like it was you know um very babyish you know they still need a lot of support in sixth grade reminding they, they don't have the skills to manage um their own time their homework their projects their any of that stuff so it's like a lot of still teaching the basics and i wanted to skip that and talk about poetry you know i wanted them to come to me prepared that doesn't ever happen you still have to prepare them all the way through so <laughs> it's true yep, I mean, because I've taught 12th graders and, you know, and, and the college level. So it literally never ends. Um, so these are the standards that we need to do a deep dive of. So social studies for four through eight. And you'll see here, and I'm going to bring, make this just a little bit bigger. Hold on. Um, because we're going to take a look at 
in a moment the teaks, which I know you're familiar with. Yes. So the thing is, and, and I, whatever manuals they have out there, whatever programs there are, those are all good and they're, they're helpful, but they are not more helpful than being familiar with this document okay. and being familiar with the teaks. There is nothing more helpful than being familiar with whatever content area you are learning, your standards document and the corresponding teaks for your okay. grade level content area, because it is what the state sends to the test maker. It's the only thing the test maker uses in order to create. Now, if you get a program, I mean, that's why a lot of times in these manuals, the questions are not like exactly what, like the way they are on the test. Mm -hmm. Pearson, the test maker is very protective over the their test questions you know you're not even allowed to talk about them afterwards and it's you know all this testing security and they have they don't often put out study manuals and so they do have some available online on their mm -hmm. website but very very few and so everybody has to go off of what they know of previous tests and try to come up with something good but always from this this document and your corresponding teaks. So we'll look at uh, standard four. I'm just going to jump to, oh my Lord. Sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Yes, I am. Uh, geography, economics, government, citizenship, culture, science, technology. And I believe there might be a one on the other or maybe that's it and society because for the teaks it also has like social studies skills there but we'll we'll look to see if there's another one on the other page but this essentially is going to be a recurring theme like through all of the different so ec through 6 social studies they have history geography economics government but they have different levels of rigor and depth with which they cover things and introduced at different times specific times we do not talk about slavery in kindergarten we don't teach it we don't talk about it it comes in a certain time in elementary cognitively that maturity wise there's a reason why we we discuss things at a, a certain time um, in their growth and why we begin in in kindergarten in the way that we do and we'll later take a look at the teaks for kindergarten just so you can get I think it's important for any content area to understand the scope like the sort of horizontal planning if you will for the state of Texas right as far as social studies is concerned because there's an overarching goal whenever the the legislature and the scholars and the teachers come together and they they come up with a content area like they did with the science of teaching reading they saw a need they looked for what they wanted the students to come out with what would what would be the goals how are they going to be better in their lives after school by this content area. So I think it's important to understand how each of the levels build on each other in order to achieve that goal of social studies instruction in the state of Texas, whether I agree with it the way it's being done or not. <laughs> so um, Teacher and reading was <laughs> that what? The science of teacher and reading was really hard. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, I, I mean, uh, uh, the general public doesn't understand how much you guys have to prepare, how much teachers have to prepare, how much they have to study, how many hoops they have to go through, <laughs> the difficulty of their job to um, keep a positive classroom climate where everybody feels safe and loved and important and able to overcome whatever um, you know difficulties they have and then have them be all different. None of them are the same. They come from different backgrounds. Some of them have supportive parents, some of them have abusive parents. I mean, you, it's really a difficult job to do yeah. successfully. So um, I commend you for, te for choosing teaching because it's really literally the most important job I feel on the planet, but I'm biased. So let's get <laughs> back to this. Each of these standards you gotta go through and you gotta see what do I need to know about history four through eight, 
And what do I need to be able to apply in my classroom regarding, regarding social studies instruction four through eight regarding history? That's what this one is about. Mm -hmm. Same, but this way, but it's about geography. Now, I can already tell you that um, with one grade level, a geography, um, you know, lesson would be different. Do you have to do geography in each of the grade levels? Yes, you have to do a little bit of geography at each of the grade levels. Kindergartens are learning something about geography. Um, and it might not be the same that a fourth grade class is going to be learning. And I'll tell you just from having studied the TEKS with other teachers, that fourth grade is sort of um, Texas history light if you will. It is the beginnings. We learn about the Native Americans and the different tribes that were here and what it was like for the Texas settlers. And so it is in seventh grade, Texas history is like a little bit more on steroids, right? It's like Texas history AP, right? At the seventh grade level, still talking about the same things. So if the test maker is saying, you know, uh, Ms. Salceda is currently working on a geography unit with her fourth grade class, which would be which one of the following activities would be most engaging for her students, right? And then they give you um, answer choices. And the first one is, um, you know, locating um, the hemisphere of the earth, the, the different continents, right? Locating the different continents on uh, a map, right? A chart. Um, labeling the, the rivers oh, in Texas. Hold on really quick, ma'am. Hold on, hold on. Sure, please. absolutely. Just pause this real quick. Here, all joins. And this is why my videos are bad because I don't have any time to edit and or very much knowledge. I mean, I have some talking to myself. She doesn't come back. I'm going to pause. Why didn't you just leave that? Sorry, I, I paused. Yeah. Let's see. I think it's this one. Deal. Okay, so this is where you go and and um to to access your teaks. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm sure you're familiar with that. So here's the elementary. You'll have to uh access both the mm -hmm. elementary and the junior high, right? But let's just take a look at kindergarten just so you can see what like they're supposed to be doing. So kindergarten is a study of self home family so we don't jump into like historical events i mean there are mm -hmm. things that you do do like if it's a like i remember in kindergarten one of my daughters because they're in first and second uh it must have been my ziri my eight-year-old but she was in kindergarten during the election so she learned about all that you know what i mean and and learned about the president and his name was and all that stuff um but it was part of the, you know, um, the learning environment. And so it, it was um, added, but the different, you know, the flag, the Pledge of Allegiance, um, how their life might be difficult, uh, different without modern technology. So not really talking about like life as an Indian, but like, <laughs> just beginning to think about what it would be like for things to be different and to think about like the back in the day. Um, sequence and categorize information. So these are the social studies skills that I was talking about. And so here is the end of like, um, well, let's go back and see the standards really quick. Where are they? Um, nope. It's not there. That's what I thought. So social studies skill is is also on the teaks. Um, and I guess the social studies skill comes from the first three. You know what I mean? So the value of social sciences, 
integrates various so, social science, um, you know, disciplines and here the knowledge and skills. Number three, standard number three is only knowledge and your, your TEKS, right? Your social studies TEKS, it's all about that. And it's not just about the TEKS, it's being able to effectively plan instruction, um, curriculum units, you know, assessments of your students, um, and be able to evaluate their skill level and, and their needs, right, on a day-to-day -day basis, and then, and then adjust planning and implementation of, of instruction as need be. So that's okay. standard three. And I would go through your standards and mm -hmm. do a deep dive, print them out, write on them each standard write in your own words if you learn these so well you'll be able to tell what standard you're looking at in the scenario you know what i'm saying like you'll be able to tell okay they're asking you really about like implementation and not so much a fact about history or <clears throat> you know reference to something um about assessing them um, but you do need to know about that. You need to know about, uh, and you and you should. You should know, you know, the difference uh, between formative and summative assessments from from your, you know, successes in the other subject areas with core um, four through eight. So you know about the different types of how important formative assessments are. They form and they drive our planning and our instruction, right? We use it as a gauge to what the student needs, not only to their mastery. We're not just trying to measure how masterful they are. We're trying to find areas and of uh, weakness and ways in which we can support that so that they continue to move and progress along. <laughs> As, as we need them to. So this is for kindergarten, you know, super basic uh, as far as community, right? And that's the beginnings of social science, right? H history, the study of history is a study of people, the study of social science, the way it was in the very beginning of time, you know, during the Mayans and the Aztecs and the Indians is, is very, very different from the way that it is now, the way they are li lived their lives. Um, the conflict that, that arised later on, they'll talk about it, the conflict that arised between the Europeans and the natives because of that clash, because they lived so differently and didn't understand each other and didn't speak the same language, you know, what was a lot of part of that angst. So looking back at those uh, things, but they start off very basic here, just learning about community. What is a community? Who do you have in your house? What's a family even? You know, who are authority figures? Who are authority figures at home in the community? And so even what a police officer is and a fireman and their, their use, you know, it's not so much history, but like social science as it's living and breathing today in our society for kindergartners. And then we build and build and build, and we're going to jump back to fourth grade for you. And as I said, um, just from doing tutoring sessions and doing deep dives of different uh, grade levels, I know that fourth grade, after reading the introduction, and each one of them has an introduction that, that sort of tells you what is this specific focus within the larger goal of social studies instruction in the state of Texas. And um, so it talks about um, the early beginnings to present within the context of North America, historical content focuses on Texas history. So um, including the Texas Revolution, the establishment of the Republic of Texas. Um, and so two of the grade levels within the TEKS focus on Texas. So how much do you need to know about Texas history specifically, would you say? When I took the last test, I would have said a lot because- a It's lot a lot. If they want you to know, it's gonna be heavy yeah. on it. This is Texas. This is where we live yeah. in a Republican state. They're super happy. Our, our history is the best history and more important history. And you need to study like that, right? So I wouldn't super de duper study about like American history, even though you should know basic American history stuff. You need to know specifics about Texas history stuff because that is what- our leadership and the people in charge of the Texas Education Agency care about right now. So um, super deep dive into fourth grade. That is, and, and not just deep dive in knowing the people and places, but 
what is the difference between, um, you know, fourth grade instruction and seventh grade? Because that's the next big, you know, Texas history push, right? So you know what's appropriate as far as activities. You'll be able to choose the most appropriate activity for a fourth grade student based on geography because you know what they should be studying. So they might give you more than one appropriate response there. They do it on purpose, which is why they're able to say most appropriate. That means more than one is appropriate. If, if you're saying most appropriate, you've already admitted to me that there are two appropriate responses. One is more appropriate than the other based on the specific things that they say. So when they give you a grade level, pay attention to it, like kind of put your little that's like a one red flag to pay attention to because it, it and it should give you a hint, right? You should know fourth grade. Okay, that's like Texas history light, right? It it does say North America. However, it says historical content focuses on all of this stuff. So um, subsequent annexation to the United States. Like they even wanted us to, to introduce the idea that we left. We said, peace, peace mm -hmm. out, homies. And we were our own thing for a little bit. Um, location, distribution, patterns of economic acti activities is something that fourth graders look into. Will they look at it as deeply as seventh graders? No, they won't. No. They will super look. And then, and then even more so in high school, they'll look even more so in depth um, with some of these, you know, concepts about like forced migration and, you know, other factors that, you know, force migration in, in some type of way, like economic or um, natural disaster or um, war-torn countries, stuff like that. Um, but we're certainly not going to delve in so deep into that in the fourth grade. Um, but we are going to talk about settlement patterns, you know, and movement and the idea of movement and that people move for different reasons. Spanish settlements, missions. Um, so students explain how uh, American Indians govern themselves and identify characteristics of Spanish colonial, uh, colonial and Mexican governments in Texas as Texas sort of sees it, I should say. Um, I, I would like to bring your attention to five, because I always like to bring their, your attention to five, because it, it, again, reiterates what I've been saying about the sort of horizontal way that I like for all students to look at their and think of their um, content area. I want for you to look at and examine uh, fourth grade teaks, make notes, and I always say, like, get one you know, I'm going to use my sister's Sensi card. She's so cute. This is her Sensi card. Um, <laughs> but one, the, obviously the bigger ones, right? The big, the big no cards and um, fourth grade, or you could do it by the different, um, by these different areas, you know, these here, history, geography. So you could do one card for history and then write fourth grade and then do what is the, what are the things and people they need to know and the skills they need to know? And then uh, the uh, for fifth grade, what are the things they need to know and what are the skills? It'll be different. You need to know how it changes and how it also builds. How does it change? How does it build to the next level? Um, and, and then doing that, and there's something about a, a lot of students that I meet with um, want to just like, sort of meet with me and not have to go back and like take these notes, but we're, we're, we're learning a content area and many times studying things that we haven't thought about since we ourselves were in fourth grade or seventh grade. If we can't, if we went to school in Texas, I mean, as I go through these, even the American Indians, which, um, you know, I am just all about my indigenous heritage, which is what I'm going <laughs> to get into really quickly. Um, but we'll take a look at history. Remember, this is for fourth grade. So if my card said history, right, in fourth grade, we're going to talk, American Indians is a really big thing, and Texas before, you, before European exploration. So that's going to be identifying and compare ways of life of um, Indian groups in Texas prior to the invasion. 
Um, and so all of those, these, if you don't know them and you can't just off the top of your head, I can only do one off the top of my head where I can give you a sort of, it's like I could teach it to you, Karankawin, mm -hmm. because my great great grandfather was a Karankoan tribe member and they roamed um, the Mexican uh, coast all the way up toward past, you know, um, South Padre Island, that area, almost up into Corpus through Brownsville. And that was their area. They were fishermen. They were tall, um, incredibly brave. My son is like six one, and nobody knows why. I mean, I, we know why, but but what we don't know from where. We're all like pretty normal sized Mexicans, um, but we have Caranco in blood, and it came out in him. It's pretty cool, and um, you know. So I have a little bit of knowledge. They were also a little bit on the bully inside. They really defended, and they like to do like dramatic performances after like a war, you know, to sort of ward off and and tell you know people keep your your distance um but that could have just been a, a like a horrible gossip that was spread by the white man after they stole their and and dindled them down to nothing you know until they were uh basically living in uh, trailers so the point is is that i would have to look up and briefly research but luckily you don't have to because i collected videos on such things for you and so there are like short videos about the different ones that will give you just like a working reference of it for you to be able to choose the best response um on on the exam but um, if they mention it in the teaks, yes, you should have a working, don't memorize it, but have a working knowledge of it, you know, of, of that. Um, and, and also think about the way in which the student is gonna be thinking about that knowledge. You know the way that they're going to have you identify, the students have to identify and compare the ways of life. So you have to know and be able to help them identify and compare the different ways of life of these Indians with them. So that's going to be one of the types of questions they're going to ask you, you know what I mean? To, to identify the differences between these two uh, Indian groups. And, and you have to be able to choose the best answer for fourth grade. Now, you might still talk about these people um, in seventh grade, but in a different way. It's going to be after Europeans get there and um and it's going to be sort of a different uh, you know adding on to what we already know like the breaking it up from like just them getting there to maybe like the trail of tears where you probably get more into that with in seventh grade exactly exactly so um locate american indian groups remaining in texas um let's just do that right now <laughs> okay Remaining, oh, I hate writing, Native American in Texas. Native American in Texas. Do, do, do. Native American Indian groups have shaped Texas. The, we are Texas. It's not like we, oh, anyway, I don't like, yes, we. <laughs> our Texas we didn't just I guess you can say we shaped it but we know Texas was stolen um you know from from people who had a very thriving you know civilization it's kind of sad um before the 1900s historians have estimated more than 50 Native American nations lived and thrived across Texas so where are we now I just want to see a picture um uh, uh, uh. Rio Grande Valley what what <laughs> I'm so proud to be from the valley and it really irritates me I live in San Antonio right now which I hate but it's only because of divorce and co-parenting and me wanting to, our my kids to be disrupted the least but so the valley's my home and I hate it when people like make it big and then they leave and they trash the valley like then and that like it is a beautiful amazing place and it has always been and will continue to be okay let me see this is not it 
I'm looking for because I know they're going to give it to you on a map type situation. Well, what? Sad. Uh, it's being refreshed. I hope so, because that's the that's a government agency. They should have that stuff working. We pay a lot of taxes to to have our stuff available. Anywho, let's see. Here we are. These are the ones that we were looking at. I, I recognize the name. I'm going to go get a water. But I'm going to click on this so we can see it large, larger, just so you can bless you. Thank you. Look how low those member numbers are. It's not nearly as much as there used to be for sure. Absolutely. Um, I would say Texas was the most like ruthless in its land taking, I mean, they took so much land from Mexico, like literally after Mexico was just recovering, they were like 15 years into recovery after finally kicking the Spaniards out, you know what I'm saying? And, and then we went in and we literally stole everything, like whole families were separated, the border crossed us, it was crazy. Um, but the killing spree that continued in Texas, like if you just look at the, and you wouldn't have this conversation with fourth graders, absolutely not. <laughs> But you could have it with high schoolers, right? Or if you were teaching a DC class, uh, US history class, you could. Um, they really did a good job of making sure none of them were stayed behind. I mean, like, look how little are left. And we had possibly the most thriving were there next to Mexico. It was just all native land. So um, but anyway, there they are, and you need to be able to look at them. Now, in each of the grade levels that you would teach this, right, fourth grade, and because we're looking at fourth grade right now, you also have to talk about this in seventh grade. You would talk about it differently at, at both levels, right? Activities you would do would be uh, different. Um, so just keep that in mind when you're taking those um, notes down over some of the same ideas. Yes, that we discuss them in different ways and that they build on each other. So, um, so here we looked them up. There's only three of them and there's like together, maybe 2000, less than, it was like less than 2000 because one was like 400 and I think everybody was Kickapoo. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, history again and then uh this is the sort of mexican war um many names here and me like to be honest with you I, I, many of them i don't know but you definitely need to know who these just like a working like davy crockett was more than that stupid hat that he wore you know what i mean you have to know like what he contributed to uh, the foundation of the Texas Republic, right? So, so try to think about the notes you write as in, in what the student has to learn, like the important leaders for founding. So you need to like, you know, know how, what his impact was in founding Texas. Like that's, you don't need to know where he was born, what, who his grandma was or any of that stuff. You need to know how, how did he impact uh, Texas as we know it, or as they knew it, I guess. Um, so describe the successes, problems, organizations of Republic of Texas, such as the establishment of a constitution, 
economic struggles, relations with American Indians, the Texas Rangers, um, explain the events that led to the annexation of Texas and the impact of the U.S.-Mexican War. So, um, yeah, I... I would definitely go through and make sure um, because many of these, like you'll just know, like you don't have to like specifically study, but just a few of them. Um, yes, job, really yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, and we'll go to geography really quickly and see, describe ways people have adapted to modify their environment in Texas. So we've had to adapt the different things, present and past, such as timber clearing, agricultural production, wetland drainage, energy production, construction of dams. So all of these ideas need to be, um, you know, just a working knowledge of them, the different, like, I'd have to look up wetlands drainage. Like I, I wouldn't feel comfortable asking, answering a question about instruction having to do with wetlands drainage because I don't know a whole bunch about it, but I'm just gonna look at it really quickly. Oh my God, there's laws. Um, let's see, do, do, do. So wetlands are often drained for conversion to use to other land uses. So wetlands are drained and the drainage water pumps into adjacent wetlands and aquatic systems. OK, in many areas of the United States, organic soils that formed as wetlands have been drained for agricultural use. Is that good to drain a wetland that oh, I just look, it says, is it bad? That answered my own question. Negative impacts associated with wetland drainage include reduced or loss of biodiversity. I knew it wasn't going to be bad. You're probably not supposed to teach that, though. Um, just how we do it, and we use it for agricultural needs, and uh, why do farmers do it? Uh, wetlands are species-rich habitants performing valuable ecosystem services such as food protection, water quality enhancement, food chain support, and carbon sequestration. So worldwide, wetlands have been drained to convert them into agricultural land or industrial or urban areas. Let's see. I'm trying to look for Texas, though. Why doesn't it? Did I not look up Texas? Sorry, did I? It's, but... I forgot I was doing Texas. Just. Um... Let's see if this government website works. Well, I mean, it didn't take us to a website, but at least there's this. Oh my God, I hope that they're not, I know exactly what these are. These are on the way to Louisiana. Like we don't really have them in the Valley, but they're gorgeous. And I've seen, you know, just yeah. really beautiful wetlands. I mean, I wouldn't go swimming in it, but I certainly beautiful to look at. Probably a crocodile or two in there. Absolutely. Or like a swamp monster, like something, leeches, snakes, all sorts of, no, alligator gar. Okay. So, so this is like a little thing and you could actually even like break this apart for your students when you were doing it in the fourth grade or the seventh grade, you know, depending on, and I'm sure they have little videos and stuff while you're going over this. Um, support the food web, um, make them make little bubble graphs and stuff like that while they take their notes so they can, you know, chunk the text and understand um, is something that I would do. So I would do like a, maybe a slideshow and do the benefits of the wetland and one bubble that they could make would be improved water qualities. And then and, and I would tell them how it does that. Wetlands absorb and they filter sediments, nutrition and other natural and man-made pollutants that would otherwise damage the rivers, the lakes and the streams. So they act like a filter with all that netting and webs and other stuff that's down there. 
support the food web because they trap and they hold the nutrients there. They increase the food supply all the way up the food chain. We were just talking about that and what could be lurking in that water. So from mammals, birds, larger predatory fish like the alligator gar. I mean, it didn't say aquatic invertebrates, shellfish, forage fish. Like we said, crocodiles, alligators. Wetlands provide both temporary and permanent homes for thousands of species, fish, mollusks, birds, amphibians, reptiles, mammals, insects. These animals in turn provide us with clues about the health of the ecosystem and its water quality. So when they start to die, that's when we're like, what the heck is in the water? Like what is going to our water systems? Like we need our water systems to be. And so like they provide puerecitos, for, you know what I mean? We're using them as like the buffer, but we really do see like if, if they see a certain species is dying and they can see like, oh, that there's like an algae pollution or some sort of something going on. So it, it's very important. Gulf Coast wetlands. Ooh, we have wetlands in. These are the types of things that are in there. Crabs, oysters. I guess the wet. Oh, that makes sense. The wetlands are like where that all that at South Padre Island, where it's all crazy, sort of like like that. Um, it looks just like the that. Base. Mm hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Like the bay. Mm -hmm. It's like a giant wetland, <laughs> you know, <laughs> kind of, it's certainly underneath. <laughs> there you go, South Texas wetlands. Oh, there we are. There we are. Ooh, even our resacas are there. So, um, and so you would talk about the different types of wetlands in Texas, right? And you would want to super not just only show this, you know, maybe go out <clears throat> and take some pictures of some places or get them off the internet of the different resacas and uh, so that they could make a connection like, oh, we have wetlands in the valley. You know, that's really cool. We just, we went back up and said, wetlands are not very common and there's not a lot of them in places so pretty cool um sand sheet wetlands um are isolated small isolated depressions they are found in places where wind exposed clay soils that trap and hold rainwater these depressions often move oh wait provide the only fresh water for wildlife in a normally dry climate i'm not really sure what they're talking about there i mean i guess i kind of but it's not really what i was particularly talking about um the resacas that we have they are channels of the rio grande river that have been cut off from the river and filled with silt and creating marshes and ponds but most sand sheet wetlands and resacas or fm ethereal no they're not they've been there since i've been alive and it's like 40 years the plant and wildlife using them very seasonally, depending on the quality. That's true. That is true. Like there won't be a lot of fish and sometimes they stock the different resacas. Like I remember Brownsville had a, um, like kids fish tournament or something. And they gave every kid that signed up like a, a free little, um, fishing pole and they had stocked the fish with, with, freshwater fish and it was really cool and we got to go fishing um let me see central texas vanishing treasure so these are reasons why they go away anyway this is the type of studying i would do just couple of minutes now I feel like I'm an expert on wetlands no I'm just kidding but I do feel better about my knowledge um in wetlands and to be able to describe the different sort of types um and this there's a place called uh I'm trying to think of the name of it I'm not gonna think of the name of it but it's in like north 
Texas and it has this, these really tall trees and everybody's home is nestled amongst these tall trees, but like there's rivers and lakes. And so there are like little marshes and stuff like that there, even because I, I had a student that I visited there, um, an intern and I thought, man, it'd be great to live in this environment every day. I feel like I'm a freaking fairy in a fairy forest. Like, and, and oh, Magnolia, Texas. That's what it's called. That's the name of it. It's a very beautiful place in Northeast Texas. I've seen it on TV. <laughs> seen it? Okay. Well, it's very, very nice. Um, okay. Well, I'm going to have to go. Let me see, because I have another session, but he hasn't, um, I have another session right now. And. No worries at all. I, I, I feel better. I think I'll do exactly what you said with, it, with getting the, the cards and then just breaking them down by grade level. And right. Then by and two. Ab absolutely. And so just to go really quickly before I let you go back to Cora here, just to take a look at this. Um, on the left hand side, you have what you need to know, the things you need to know. And right here, this one is like, you know, all of the vertical alignment of the social studies right um yeah. and, and that's what i meant vertical alignment i think i said horizontal before but the uh vertical alignment of the different grade levels as you go across you know if as you as you move up social studies instruction um and and it's all connected right it's all connected and then uh, so on the left hand side is what we need to know it tells you the state specific content and performance standards dealing with history geography all of those things that we discussed but on the left hand side is is excuse me the right hand side is what is really really important for you to make sure you feel comfortable and that you can sort of imagine what it would look like for the um social studies teacher to be doing that because it is your implementation of your knowledge so this is what you need to know and this is what you need to be able to do in your social studies classroom so typically the correct answers come and it is the teacher doing something from the right hand column okay then no that's helpful because I, I didn't know about that this either excellent so those are both in there um and and if not, you can find them on the Texas Education Agency website. Um, and and let me know if you if you need anything else. I'm available Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, Tuesdays and Thursdays, um, nine to eleven, using the same link. So keep this link. Um, you know, like save it in like your Google Drive or something. That way, yes. anytime you have a question, you know, if you look and you're like, oh, let me pop in and see if Miss Elsa has time because Tuesdays and Thursdays, I just have it open. And sometimes like, I think the most I've had at one time is three kids, but like the discussion, everything's needed for everyone. And so as I'm talking to someone, I might be answering a question that you have about your own content area, but I'm talking about it, you know what I mean? you understand because you do core how much uh we do the same thing right pedagogy is pedagogy whether i'm teaching theater or whether i'm teaching math you know what i'm yeah. saying differentiation is differentiation of instruction it's just differentiation of a different content so um study study and if you have any questions just let me know i will i appreciate it a lot absolutely my pleasure thank you bye have a beautiful weekend enjoy you it too. bye bye Bye-bye. I cannot believe I made that mistake. I, I was thinking of horizontally because it's like K through 12, but that's not what horizontal planning is. Just sort of clarify before I hang up and stop recording that it is, um, you know, vertical alignment is what we speak about that as far as, um, yeah, and vertical planning for social studies. Um, junior high teachers and elementary teachers would get together during the summer to vertical plan right to see like how can the junior i mean how how can the elementary students sort of like help better prepare high school i mean excuse me junior high students and then likewise with junior high to high school so junior high has to do a lot of um you know thinking about that vertical planning i mean we all do have to think about it and it's important to think about the scope 
K through 12, um, because we need to know what skills are coming to us with, but what should they have come to us with anyway? What should they have learned? And then how do I help them sort of, you know, support their needs so that they can continue to move and progress and, and achieve the, the goal of that particular content area for here? It was social studies. So just to correct my misstatement, I don't know why I have, I'm sick today. So my brain is not 100% in it, but it is, um, I want you to examine the scope of, um, you know, K through 12, but it really, it's like vertical planning. You know, when we talk about horizontal planning, we're talking about first grade teachers all sort of planning together, um, all on the same level or, you know, all fifth grade social studies teachers getting together and planning. And um, that's all I have to say about that. So, Thank you for watching the video. If you haven't already subscribed, if you're not a subscriber and you watch my videos, please subscribe so that I can get some sort of something. Um, you know, it, it does help other teachers get access to the videos. It pops up in their feed and um, it helps me get a little bit of compensation because I'm just a teacher like you guys. So I appreciate your time and I will see you next time.